In this video tutorial, we are going to walk through what occurs during the excitation and contraction of skeletal muscle. The steps of excitation will focus on the cellular level of a muscle and how somatic motor neurons chemically excite muscle fibers. The steps of contraction will focus on the subcellular level of a muscle, outlining how myofibrils and sarcomeres within a muscle fiber contract. At relaxation, muscle fibers have a very low concentration of calcium in the sarcoplasm, while the sarcoplasmic reticulum has an exceptionally high concentration of calcium. This forms an incredible 10,000-fold difference. In other words, for every one calcium ion in a sarcoplasm, there are 10,000 in a sarcoplasmic reticulum. Also at relaxation, tropomyosin proteins are held in place by troponins on the actin filaments, blocking the myosin binding sites, and as such, myosin heads are separate from the actin filaments. In order to go from relaxation to contraction, muscle excitation needs to occur first, so we will begin with that. The events of muscle excitation begin at neuromuscular junctions, which are where somatic motor neurons meet with the muscle fibers. In other words, a cell of the nervous system meets a cell of the muscular system. The steps of muscle excitation involve three different electrical signals, also known as potentials. A somatic motor neuron action potential, a muscle end plate potential, and a muscle action potential. First, a neuron action potential will be sent from the motor cortices of the cerebrum, down the spinal cord, out the nerves, and to the muscle fibers of the specific muscle that is to be contracted. Once the action potential reaches the terminals of the somatic motor neuron, acetylcholine release is stimulated. Neurotransmitter release such as this is outlined in a separate video. This neurotransmitter release leads to significant amounts of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction, which is where acetylcholine will diffuse across the space to ultimately bind to specific ligand-gated receptors on the muscle sarcolemma. In other words, these receptors are specific to acetylcholine, and only acetylcholine will activate them. Upon binding, acetylcholine will excite these receptors, thus activating them and causing them to open. Once open, enormous amounts of sodium will rush into the muscle fiber, traveling down the sodium electrochemical gradient. This results in local depolarization or excitement of the muscle fiber, thus creating the second electrical signal in the muscle excitation chain, a muscle end plate potential, which is a type of graded potential. Once enough sodium enters the muscle fiber, and the resulting muscle end plate potential reaches a specific level or threshold, a muscle action potential is generated. This is the third electrical signal in the muscle excitation chain, and the signal that will ultimately initiate the steps of contraction. Because neuromuscular junctions are typically in the middle of muscle fibers, muscle action potentials will propagate in both directions down the sarcolemma of muscle fibers. It is important to note here that the muscle action potential propagating down the muscle fiber will not only travel on the periphery of the fiber, but will also be propagated inwards. The inward propagation is because the muscle action potential travels down T tubules, or transverse tubules, which extend off of the sarcolemma. This is extremely important because it allows the muscle action potential to reach all levels of the muscle fiber thus allowing the excitation to signals to reach all myofibrils, which are the contractile units of the muscle fiber. Now, as the muscle action potential travels down the sarcolemma and T-tubules of the muscle fiber, L-type voltage-gated calcium channels become activated, and these channels stand for long-lasting voltage-gated calcium channels. Now remember, the action potentials are electrical signals, so therefore it makes sense that these action potentials can activate 
a channel that is voltage gated. Once activated, these voltage gated calcium channels will activate secondary messenger proteins, which ultimately activate calcium release channels located in the membranes of sarcoplasmic reticula throughout the muscle fiber. Remember from earlier that at rest there is a 10,000 fold difference of calcium between sarcoplasmic reticula and sarcoplasm. So this means that upon activation of calcium release channels, calcium will rush out from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm of the muscle fiber following calcium's electrochemical gradient. This is the end result of all the steps of muscle excitation. What comes next are the steps of muscle contraction. The steps of muscle contraction occur within muscle fibers, specifically within the sarcomeres of myofibrils. Remember that at rest, myosin heads were separated from actin filaments. And this is because the myosin binding sites on actin were blocked by tropomyosin proteins held in place by troponins. Going from rest to contracted revolves around three major aspects or triggers. The first major aspect or trigger is the fact that before contraction even begins, myosin is already energized, cocked, and prepped for an upcoming contraction. This is because following the previous contraction, the myosin heads bound ATP, which then quickly was hydrolyzed by the binding site ATP ACE, which is an enzyme. By breaking the phosphate bonds of ATP, myosin becomes energized with an ADP and a free phosphate attached. The second major aspect or trigger is calcium, which will allow myosin and actin to bind. When calcium rushes out of the sarcoplasmic reticula during the final stages of excitation as just described, these calcium ions bind to troponins and change their structural conformations, or changes their shape. This causes tropomyosin to slide off of the myosin binding sites on actin filaments. At this moment, myosin and actin filaments immediately bind together to form a cross bridge. At first, myosin binds weakly to the actin filaments, sort of like first lightly grabbing hold of a blanket. Doesn't take long, however, before myosin and actin strongly bind, as if you grip the blanket more tightly. The formation of the strong cross bridge between myosin and actin induces the third major aspect, or third trigger, which is the release of the free phosphate from the myosin heads. As a result, the myosin heads swing forward, the energy for which comes from the hydrolysis of ATP, thus moving the actin filaments towards the center of the sarcomere, or the M-line. This should be like flinging the blanket over your body. Myosin swinging actin towards the center of the sarcomere is termed the power stroke, which is essentially a single contraction cycle. Immediately after the power stroke, ADP is released from the myosin, and a brand new ATP binds to the open binding site. The binding of the new ATP does two things. One, it will release the myosin-actin crossbridge. In other words, myosin and actin will become detached from, in, from, from each other. And it will also re-energize myosin through ATP hydrolysis, again through the breaking of a phosphate bond. This returns myosin back to step one again that is, being energized, cocked, and prepped for a new contraction cycle. The steps just discussed represent a single contraction cycle. The result is a shortening of the sarcomeres of only about 10 nanometers, representing a relative movement of about 1% of the muscle length once all muscle fibers are included. Obviously, muscles shorten much more than 1%. So in order to get significant levels of muscle contraction and tension created, muscle cycles need to be performed multiple times. In other words, it's multiple cycles of actin being moved over myosin 
multiple contraction cycles are produced when multiple motor neuron action potentials are sent to the muscle fiber, creating multiple muscle action potentials, thus multiple pulsatile releases of calcium from sarcoplasmic reticula, and ultimately multiple attachments and detachments of myosin and actin. Essentially, you can think of it as going through all the steps we went through for excitation and contraction several times. This is called unfused tetanus, and this is actually how the majority of our muscle contractions occur each day. Once the motor neuron action potential cease, no more acetylcholine is released, excess acetylcholine is removed, and the muscle fibers are relaxed. In this video tutorial, we walk through what occurs during the excitation and contraction of skeletal muscles. We reviewed excitation, focusing on how somatic motor neurons excite muscle fibers, and we also focused on contraction, detailing how myofibrils and their sarcomeres contract, ultimately leading to muscle fiber contraction and whole muscle contraction. Any further questions or points of clarification should be directed to Dr. Pollock during office hours or by appointment.